Hello everyone. For those who don't know me, I am Dr. Sri Pratap Mohanamurthy. This session will run for 30 to 40 minutes. In this session, I'll explain the do's and don'ts in the CASC examination. So in this session, I'm going to cover the do's and don'ts in the CASC examination. So what are the things that you should do in the real CASC exam to pass? And what are the things that you should not do in the CASC examination? I'm also going to uh, talk about the new digital format, uh, the requirements for the new digital format. Uh, so you can be more prepared when you face the real examination. The first important slide is about the recent changes. CASC exams for this time is going to be based on video consultation, based on a different platform. This is approved by the General Medical Council. Due to the COVID situation, this time it's going to be video consultation and digital format examination. In the real examination, you will have two circuits. In the first circuit, you will have eight single stations. You will have four minutes reading time and also seven minutes performance time with a warning at the end of six minutes. Now in the new digital format, an invigilator is going to be present in each station. So when you finish reading the stations, you'll have one minute, when you have four minutes reading time, you finish reading the station, the question, then the invigilator will ask you to start performing. So you will perform for seven minutes. At the end of six minutes, they will also indicate that you have one more minute to complete the task. And at the end of seven minutes, you have to stop and then move to the next station. So in first circuit, you will have eight single stations, four minutes reading time and seven minutes performance time with a warning at the end of six minutes. Out of these eight stations, six stations are based on management problems. One station is about history taking and one station is about examination. Examination includes mental state examination, physical examination, capacity assessment, etc. So don't think that all eight stations are going to be management stations. Six stations among the eight are management stations. One station will be history taking and one station is examination. In the second circuit, you will have 90 seconds reading time, one and a half minutes reading time, and also seven minutes performance time with a warning bell at the end of six minutes. So you'll have a warning at the end of six minutes. At the end of seven minutes, you have to stop and move to the next station. The second circuit, there are eight stations, four stations based on history taking and four stations based on examination. Again, the terminology examination refers to mental state examination, capacity assessment, risk assessments, etc. So overall, you will have 16 stations to perform, five stations based on history taking, five stations on examination, and six stations on management. Now going to important essential tips. The most important tips for you to do is to form practice group. Make sure that you have practice group of three to four people. You practice the exam stations mainly. There are about 175 examination stations which are frequently and repeatedly tested in the real exams. So if you practice well in the station, then you, if you practice those stations well, then you'll feel more confident when you do it in the real examination. And you also have to understand that most of these stations are repeated. So there's high chance of these stations being repeated in the real exam. When you practice amongst yourself, try to shoot videos and be your own judge. Try to role play in different perspectives. Try to be a candidate, try to role play like a patient, try to role play like an examiner. So when you try to um, 
exchange different roles, you will be able to understand the examiner's perspective, understand the candidate's perspective, and also understand the patient's perspective or role player's perspective. So it is important to role play like a patient, a relative, uh, or relative candidate, and also examiner. And you can also shoot some videos after uh, um, doing your, after performing. You can see the videos and uh, try to correct errors. In the real examination, read the question properly and stick to the instructions. If the question says take history, then you take a history. If it says perform mental state examination, then you conduct a thorough mental state examination. If it is about risk assessment, perform comprehensive risk assessment. If it is about discussion, then you, you discuss the case. So you have to read the question properly and also stick to the instructions. If the monkey asks for a banana, then you have to give banana. If you give apple or something else, the monkey won't be happy. Similarly, you have to read the question properly and stick to the instructions. In many stations, multiple tasks are possible. So if multiple tasks are possible, then you have to divide the time between two tasks. For example, say it is history and risk assessment. Then you spend three minutes for taking history and another three or four minutes for risk assessment. So make sure that both tasks are covered. Multiple tasks are possible in many stations. You're allowed to use a notepad or paper notes. So before you start the station, you can make note of patient's age as well as gender. A copy of the task will be displayed on the screen. So if you are in doubt, you can pause for three, four seconds, take a look at the task again, read the task and perform. Okay. Don't read the task wrongly or um, not properly and then do the wrong task. You only have seven minutes, so you have to stick with the task, read the instructions properly. Often, lack of appropriate focus on the task is one of the important areas of concern. And this is one of the reasons why people often fail in certain stations. Next is candidate number. The candidate number is already going to be displayed on the screen. Each candidate will be allocated a particular candidate number in the exam. It will automatically come on the screen. So once you enter the uh, station, you just give them a brief smile to the examiner and the role player. Okay. Then you start performing the task. Always address using their surnames. In the UK, people like to be addressed using their surnames. If they specifically ask you to use four names, then you can use four names. Otherwise, please address them using their surnames. Make sure that you develop good rapport with the role player or the patient. You try to maintain good eye contact. When you have good eye contact, it only is, it conveys your confidence and professionalism. So it's important to maintain a good rapport with the role player and also maintain eye contact. The examiners are looking for a confident and enthusiastic doctor. So the confidence and enthusiasm should be displayed in your body language. Body language should be appropriate and it should be well under your control. The examiners expect you to have a nice tone in your voice. They expect you to have calm manners. You should stay calm and composed. You're going to be anxious, but it's, it's important to maintain a calm and composed posture. You should be more animated. There should be more expressions on your face. There should be more warmth and empathy during your discussion. And you should have a brave as well as smiling face. So it's important that your body language is appropriate and well under your control. You should try to put more energy in your voice. So when you speak, loudly it will be audible for the examiners so make sure that you speak loudly and 
clearly. One of the common uh, comments made by the examiners is, I was not able to hear the candidate. The candidate's message was not clear to me. So it's important that you speak loudly and clearly. If the examiners are not able to hear you, then it means that you're not mentioned it. So it's your responsibility to speak loudly as well as clearly. During the interview, you try to maintain an even pace. Don't talk too fast or too slow. If the pace, if the pace is too fast, then your natural empathy as well as warmth will suffer. Okay. At the same time, don't make it too slow. The pace should be even. So more energy in your voice, speak loudly and clearly on an even pace. When you start the interview, please start with open questions. Always start with open questions and then proceed to close questions. So you can say that, could you, could you please tell me more about your problems? Okay. And then you ask for specific examples. For example, you said you have some problems with your memory. Okay. Can you give me some examples of your memory loss? So always start with open questions, ask for examples, and then you proceed to close questions. Ideally, examiners would expect an appropriate mix of open as well as close questions. Okay. That's a good interview style. So adopt that interview style where you use both close, op, start with open questions and then proceed to close questions. Sometimes people tend to use too much of close questions. That is not helpful. Sometimes people ask multiple questions in one single question. For example, how is your sleep and appetite? So sleep is different, appetite is different. So you should not combine two questions in one sentence. And sometimes the questions are inappropriately phrased. So you need to make sure that the questions are phrased properly. So at the same time, you can start with open question. At some point, you have to ask more specific close questions. If you try to leave it more open throughout the time, then the role player and the examiner might know that you don't know to perform the task. So at some point, you need to uh, pitch in and start asking close questions to get to the bottom of the problems. Frame the questions well. This is very important for people whose first language is not English. So it's important that the questions are simple and framed clearly. If you don't frame it well, it could be misconstrued. So a lot of role players actually complain that they are unable to understand what the candidate asked or what the candidate mentioned. So it could be misconstrued. So the whole interview can go in the wrong direction. If the questions are not framed properly. So it's important that you practice those and frame the questions well. Don't ask questions bluntly. Okay? For example, um, if you want to ask for hallucinations, people might simply ask, do you hear voices? Okay? That can throw the role player. Okay? So asking questions bluntly will appear like you, you are a rude doctor. So that should be avoided. A generous, a generous preamble would be nice. For example, I would say when people are under stress, they may hear voices when there is no one around them. Have you had any such experiences recently? So the generous preamble would, would really help. So don't ask questions bluntly. So if you do that, your beginning of the interview would itself go wrong and the impression may not be good. Try to be an active listener. So the examiners are expecting the psychiatrists who have good listening skills. Listening skills involves not just passive listening, both passive as well as active listening skills. What do you mean by active listening skills? When, when you mean active listening skills, you need to talk to the patient, pick up the cues, pick up the information given by the patient and probe well into different areas. The role players have got script in which there are cues given, cues that the role players have to give it to you. So they will give you some clues. It's important that you pick up those clues and try to probe well into different areas. That is what is called as active listening skills. Okay. 
Okay. Some people don't pick up cues at all. So if you miss those cues, the examiners would know that you are just preoccupied with your own questions, but your listening skill is not active. Okay. So make sure that you pick up clues, clues and probe well into different areas. Next important area to focus is empathy. Examiners expect you expect the doctors to be empathic. Okay, so empathy is very important. So use empathic statements wherever necessary. Okay, so if you talk, if they talk about a loss or some difficulties, use empathic statements. And when you when you use empathic statements, invest those empathic comments with some genuine emotions on your face, tone, and body language. Don't just say I'm sorry. Uh, and, 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 and not show any emotions on your face. You have to show emotions on your face, on your tone, and also in your body language. So invest empathic comments with genuine emotions. Spend few seconds to express your empathy and then move on. If you don't do that, if there's lack of empathy and missed opportunities in empathy would be considered as an area of concern by the examiners. Next is history. If the task says, take a history, it means you have to get a story. The word history means story. So whenever I examine, if the task is about history taking, I always expect that by the end of seven minutes, I should have heard a story from the role player or the patient. So remember that, so your history taking should be structured and you should try to get a story by the end of seven minutes. As an examiner, if I don't get a story at the end of seven minutes, that means your history taking was not adequate. Next is exploring signs and symptoms. Imagine you're taking the final membership examination. You're, you're, you're expected to explore the signs and symptoms competently. And also the range and depth of coverage should be good enough. If you're taking the year one exam, then it's fine. But if it's a final year examination, the range and depth of coverage should be in detail and explored further. Okay. Similarly, when you explore psychopathology, the examiners would expect you to explore in detail. Superficial history taking, superficial exploration of signs and symptoms, superficial exploration of psychopathology will lead to failing of the station. So it should be explored in detail. For example, say you are asked to elicit some delusions, okay? Delusions, it's many people just elicit delusions and then they come and say, oh, I have elicited delusions, but still I have failed the station. But the problem is you need to explore further, okay? You need to ask questions like who, why, how, what, etc. For example, if a person says uh, that uh, somebody is trying to poison my food, you need to ask questions like, who do you think is poisoning your food? Why do you think they should poison your food? How do you know that they're poisoning your food? What is your explanation? Okay. So you try to seek more explanation from the patient too. You also have to assess the effects as well as coping. How do you feel about it? It must be very difficult for you. If you feel that somebody's trying to poison you for it, it must be really scary for you. So you have to ask for the effects and how they cope with those delusions. And lastly, you have to assess the degree of conviction. How sure are you about this? Could this be your imagination? Okay. So you have to assess the degree of conviction. So elicit delusions, explore further, seek explanation, assess for effects and coping, also assess the degree of conviction. Only when you do all these things, the examiner will be able to give you a comfortable pass. So just by eliciting superficially, you won't be able to pass. Next is hallucinations. A lot of people elicit hallucinations, but they don't get to the bottom of the hallucinations. You need to ask different areas. They ask for the modality of hallucination, but there are different elements you need to cover in hallucinations. Modality of hallucinations, source of hallucinations, whether it's true hallucination or pseudo hallucination, what is the timing of the hallucination? What is the content of the hallucination? What is the reality with which the hallucinations are experienced? Okay. Is this second person or third person hallucination? 
are they receiving some commands from hallucination or is it a running commentary kind of hallucination? Again, FX and coping. How are they coping with all these hallucinated experiences? So all these are important. So people just ask for modality. They ask one or two more questions. They quickly move through, move to other questions. That won't help you. You need to explore and get to the bottom of the psychopathology. Overall, the examiner would expect you to conduct a fluent interview with good structure in mind. So if there's lack of structure, if you're all over the place, then the examiners will know that you're struggling. So if you want to develop a good fluent interview style, the good structure in mind, more and more practicing would really help. While you're performing the task, switch off the autopilot mode. Some people have got this checklist in their mind. They wanted to go through the checklist of all the topics that they have in mind, but it doesn't work that way. The examiners don't like you to have the autopilot mode. Okay? You should not get through the list of topics in your mind, but listen to the patient okay? and you try to answer the questions and you need to go with the flow and roll with the punches. So you can't just uh, do it in own mode. You have to switch off the autopilot mode and improve on their active listening skills. Okay? So don't go through the list of topics in your mind. Instead, wait for the patient and you need to go with the flow and roll with the punches. Sometimes the patients in communication stations, the, the role player may have four or five specific questions to ask. Okay. Uh, for example, say there is a mother who, whose son has got schizophrenia. Okay. You may want to talk a lot about schizophrenia, the nature of schizophrenia, signs and symptoms, the treatment options, etc. But the mother is keen to know about the prognosis the outcomes of schizophrenia. So that could be her first question. So in those situations, try to address their questions first. After doing that, then you can answer other areas that you wanted to cover. If you're asked to give explanation, always elicit patient's understanding first. Say for example, you're going to talk about ECT or cognitive behavior therapy. Ask them, what do you know, what do you already know about ECT? What do you already know about CBT? The patient will give some information first. So you try to fill in those gaps, okay? That will be a good type of interview style. Avoid long winded explanation. So nobody will be able to listen to a very, very long explanation. Make sure that you give the information in a digestible form. Try to give three or four important points, okay? Don't talk. 10 lines, 15 lines, long wider explanation should be avoided. Instead, your explanation should be concise, brief, and try to give as much as information possible in few words. So the first three or four important points are the most important ones that the patients can actually remember. So try to um, make it more digestible for the patient and avoid long winded explanation. Avoid using complicated medical terms. This is something that people repeatedly do. Try to avoid complicated medical terms unless it is necessary. You can mention words like uh, a neurochemical called dopamine, um, ex a, a, a class of drugs called as selective serotonin reuptake inhibitors, but try to avoid them as much as possible. Okay? At the same time, when you're talking to professionals, in some stations, you may have to talk to the examiner directly. In those stations, try to use medical terms. So some people forget that. They go to the examiners and use uh, simple terminologies. So when you talk to professionals, then you use medical terms. When you talk to nurses, uh, again, you can use more medical terms. But in general, avoid using complicated medical terms. False information. Never give false information. Okay. Do not discuss inaccurate and misleading information. Be honest and trustworthy. If you don't know the answer, you can tell the role player that you don't have the answer right now. You will go look it up and get back to you later. That's fine. But don't give false figures. Don't give misleading information. At the same time, you can't keep saying the role player or the actor that I don't know the information. I'm going to look it up and get back to you. So you can't keep saying this again and again, because as a final cask examination, you're expected to have the facts in your hand 
and you should be able to give information. Occasionally, if you don't know, you can always say, I don't have the information, but please make sure that you don't give any false information. Risk assessments. Perform appropriate risk assessments wherever necessary. And the risk assessments should not be limited to the presenting complaint. For example, if the patient uh, has come with um, a risk of self-harm, okay, you, you should not be limited to presenting complaint alone. You should try to explore other things, risk of self-neglect, uh, risk of uh, taking alcohol and taking drugs, those kind of things. So you have to explore other areas too. Okay? And when you do risk assessment, try to have a structure in mind. Always try to remember a past, present and future. So you have to, if it is risk of self-harm, you have to ask for past history. You have to risk for, ask for present suicidal thoughts and intention. You have to ask for future plans uh, to harm themselves, etc. So past, present and future is very important. So whether it's risk of self-harm, uh, risk of violence, uh, sexual offenses, for all these things, you should have a structure in mind and ask for previous history, ask for current risks, and also ask for possible ongoing future risks. Okay, so if you don't do that, the examiner might think that you're not aware of the risk assessment, and you're, they also think that you're not aware how to manage these risks effectively in real life. So it's very important that a thorough risk assessment has to be done. Next is ending. Do not interview the patient till the last second and just say, sorry, the time is up. That's very inappropriate. That last one minute is very important. So when you have the last minute, try to summarize. Tell the patient that now we have one more minute. Let me get my thoughts together. Okay. And then you summarize the information that you covered in the last six minutes. If you finish early, some candidates look at the examiners, they look at the role players, making it awkward for everyone. Okay. If you finish early, recapitulation is very helpful. Try to recap and reflect back on what you've covered in the last six minutes or seven minutes. Again, in the last one minute, you can also ask the patient, do you have any specific questions to ask me? Or do you have any specific information you wanted to share with me? So sometimes the role player may want to ask one or two crucial questions which you wouldn't have covered. So if you ask this question in the end, they would ask the question and then you can answer the last minute. Similarly, if you ask whether you have missed any information, then they may give you some crucial information which may help you in the last minute. So make sure that you provide this opportunity for the role player. So always ask them if they have any questions in the end. Now in this digital format exam, the college has given guidelines that physical health and cognitive examination stations can be substituted. Okay? It's not possible to do physical examination and cognitive examination through video consultation. Therefore, physical examination stations and cognitive examinations are uh, not going to be asked. Instead, they may, they may ask for more history stations or mental state examination or risk assessments or capacity stations. Okay? So I don't want to cover about physical and cognitive examination. Now, coming to etiology. Now, when you talk about etiology in some stations uh, where there's discussion, okay, you may be asked to discuss etiology of the case. So in etiologies, always remember this question, why has this patient developed this disorder at this point in time? Okay, You have to remember three Ps, predisposing factors, precipitating factors, and perpetuating factors. So you have to give the information. Predisposing factors often, uh, involves things like family history, uh, previous history of psychiatric illnesses, childhood trauma and illness, personality factors. Precipitating factors includes stressful life events, non-compliance with medication recently, use of alcohol and substance misuse. Perpetuating factors would include ongoing psychosocial stressors, lack of insight in the patient. So if you remember the structure in mind, so you'll be able to explain what are the predisposing factors, precipitating factors, and perpetuating factors. Investigations. So when you talk about management plan, remember you have to mention investigations and then treatment plan. 
So investigations don't just say, I would just do bloods, I will just do urine. You need to be more specific. For example, if you're dealing with an alcoholic patient, you can always say, I will check for blood investigations, particularly liver function tests. If you're dealing with drug abuse, you can say, I will do a urine analysis, specifically checking for illicit drugs like cannabis, cocaine, etc. So try to make it more specific. Okay? And investigations does not include just blood, urine, and scans. It also involves the psychosocial investigations are part of it, which includes contacting GP to get information, contacting their care coordinators, key workers to get information, getting collateral information from family members, friends, okay? obtaining previous reports. All these comes under investigations. Okay? So try to remember those things as well and incorporate, incorporate them in your plan. In the part, in terms of management plan, we can divide the management plan into biopsychosocial model. So remember biological treatments and psychosocial interventions. Sometimes you may not have the time to cover all of them, but you can tell in the beginning that I'm going to talk about medical treatments as well as psychosocial interventions. But first I would like to talk about the medications and then you can discuss about biological treatments. Then you have to talk about psychosocial interventions. The commonest ones which examiners usually expect is psychoeducation to the patient as well as family. In many stations, you will be asked to uh, discuss elements of CBT. For example, uh, the behavioral component uh, for agoraphobia, like systematic desensitization, the behavioral component for OCD, which is exposure and response prevention. So in all these situations, you should be able to explain what you, will what you will cover in the cognitive aspect of CBT, explain what you will cover in the behavioral aspect of CBT in detail. Just don't mention the terminologies. You have to explain in detail. You have to also personalize, personalize the answers, okay? And um, feed the information. Involve the multidisciplinary team. We often just think about ourselves. So it's always a teamwork in psychiatry. So. It's not just a psychiatrist alone. We have to involve other team members like psychologists, social workers, community psychiatric nurses, occupational therapists, and also other members of the multidisciplinary team. So try to use the terminology like I, I would try to use the multidisciplinary team members in terms of managing this case. So examiners will be really impressed and also involve the different teams. So these days we've got home treatment team, a crisis resolution team, assertive outrage teams, etc. So depending upon the type of case it is, you can also involve the different teams in the, in the medium to long-term management. So management plan should incorporate the biopsychosocial model of approach. So biological and psychosocial intervention should be covered. Multidisciplinary team should be borne in mind and also try to involve the various different teams which looks after the patients. Now, legislation. A lot of people worry about mental health legislation in the UK. They worried about Mental Health Act, Mental Capacity Act, etc. See, do not worry that you don't know much about the mental health legislation in the UK. The college is aware that candidates may come from different countries with different types of legislation. The college do not want to explore this issue in detail. You can just refer to mental health legislation. You can mention that in this situation, we have to use mental health legislation like Mental Health Act or Mental Capacity Act. But you do not go into the details of the legislation and say, I will use section two, section three, section 136, all these things. You don't have to go into the details, but you can just refer to mental health legislation. That should be enough. So don't worry too much about not knowing the mental health legislation in the UK. Now, role players, do not get intimidated by the actors. So the role players have been given specific tasks to perform. Okay? So don't get intimidated by the actors and role players. You try to take control of the interview. Do not allow the role player to dictate the theme of the consultation. If you look too anxious, if you lose the confidence, then the role players may start dictating the consultation but you need to take control of the interview and not get afraid by the role players. At the same time, do not argue with the role players and examiners. So argument will not help. So in certain situations, try to accept or try to get more information. 
don't argue with the role players. In some stations, you may have to uh, deal with the examiners directly. Again, don't argue with the examiners. If they make any comments, just accept it and then move to the next, next area, but don't argue. If you argue with the role players or examiners, that will be a recipe for the disaster on the day of the exam. Okay. Now, further reading, what can you read further for the cask? You've done the theory part. You, you, all your theoretical knowledge has been tested. Okay? So what you can read is Oxford Handbook. The Handbook of Psychiatry is a wonderful book where all the symptoms and signs, risk assessments, mental state examination questions, everything is covered in the Oxford Handbook of Psychiatry. So please read Oxford Handbook. You can read ICD-10. So the classification of diseases, just to know more about the criteria. You can read Morsley Prescribing Guidelines. The have given lots of information about psychopharmacology. So, and all the guidelines are covered for various different psychiatric conditions. So, mostly prescribing guidelines would be ideal because you're also taking the exam in the UK. So, that will be the best. And then, the Royal College has published a lot of leaflets. So, you can go through the Royal College leaflets. And uh, lastly, but most importantly, please read SPMM notes. Okay. A few more points about the recent exam please read the CASC blueprint from the college website. Okay. The college has clearly mentioned that they will deliver this exam robustly and securely. The link is given here. So please make sure that you go through this link and also go through the blueprint from the college website. Most of the things I've already covered, but it's important that you read the CASC blueprint from the college website. And before the examination, you will be allotted a candidate ID and also a password. So on the day of the examination, you have to enter your candidate ID and also password. Then you will log into the website. Okay? Then you have to download the examination. A pin code will be given. Okay? So when you do that, you can download the examination. Then you will enter the examination interface. Okay? So candidate ID, password, pin code, all these will be sent to you. If not, you need to contact the college before the examination. And once you, you feed in this information, you will enter the examination interface. Now, normally in the face-to-face -face examination, there are only three participants in each station. One is the candidate, the other one is the examiner, the third person is a role player. But in this examination, there'll be four people, candidate, examiner, role player, and also invigilator. So the fourth person is invigilator. So don't be thrown if you see a fourth person in, the, in, in your window. Okay? So the role of invigilator, the invigilator will notify the reading time. They will notify the performance time and also the warning time. The invigilator will tell you when to stop and then when to start the consultation. Okay? So once you finish one consultation, you will then click next at the top right of the screen then you move to the next station. So you have to just look for the top right. It will take you to the next station automatically. At the end of eight stations, it will stop. Okay. So one circuit has got eight stations. It will stop automatically. The invigilators are also used as an additional safeguard against cheating. So invigilators are going to be present in all the rooms. Okay. And also the college will do high level identification checks to make sure that the right person is taking the examination. The college also has produced um, videos and they've informed that the difficulties in online consultation, uh, the difficulties, the nitty gritties, the, the glitches, all these things will be taken into consideration. Okay? But robust internet connection is pivotal. Make sure that you have a robust internet connection on your side. You must have a stable internet connection and sufficient bandwidth. So the internet connection and bandwidth is given below. Make sure that you have this in your computer systems. Do not use a hotspot connection or a wireless dongle. The connectivity might be uh, poor. So make sure that you don't use hotspot connection or wireless dongle. You have to have a sufficient bandwidth and, uh, and a stable internet connection. The exam platform will, be, will work on Android, Apple and Windows devices. It will work on PCs and laptop, personal computers, desktops, and laptop. The college recommends you to use a laptop or a PC. Okay? Don't use mobile phones. 
please make sure that you have a good functioning PC and a, or a laptop. You must have an update version of Chrome, Firefox, Safari, or Edge, which are installed on the device that you're using. The college recommends that you use Chrome. Okay. Chrome is better. So if you are able to download and use Chrome, that's fine, but try to get the latest version of Chrome. In the exam, in the exam it is important to consider your environment and setup as well as your technology. The examiner should be able to see your face clearly as well as hear your words clearly. Make sure you have a working camera, a microphone, and proper speakers installed in your PC and laptop. Lightning and position of the camera is important and make sure that you can see, e you can see each other clearly. Okay. So it's important that you have a good connection, but also you need to have a good working camera microphone speakers so that all of the examiners and role players are able to see you clearly and also hear you well. If you're using a portable device, ensure it is fully charged because exam time is quite long. So make sure you charge your laptop or PC in advance of starting the assessment and make sure it is connected to mains power. Okay. Use a personal computer. Don't use office computers. In, in some office computers, firewall installation is done. So you may not be able to access all the sites. So a personal computer without firewall installation is important. Okay. And lastly, do not use mobile phones or small tablets for the examination. Thank you so much. These are the important instructions you need to know about the CASC exam in general, and in particular about the new digital format.